Hello and welcome to our session, Leadership in Crisis, Public-Private Partnership for Social Good. My name is Janet Arias Martinez, and I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives for CHCI, where I've served since 2013, and I'm also a proud alum of our Congressional Internship Program. On behalf of CHCI, I want to thank Comcast, Honda North America Inc., and Procter & Gamble for their generous support of this session. Before we begin our panel, it's my distinct privilege to introduce our panel host, Congresswoman Norma Torres of California's 35th District, and our moderator, Janet Rodriguez. This session will examine the complex interplay between state, local, and national government and the private sector in combating a crisis. To help us moderate this important and timely conversation, we're delighted to have a seven-time regional and national Emmy Award-winning journalist, Janet Rodriguez, currently serving as White House correspondent for Univision Network. She covers newsworthy events involving the President of the United States and the White House for Noticiero Univision and its digital platforms. Rodriguez has traveled extensively on assignment following the biggest national stories, including the riots in Ferguson, the migrant crisis, the Texas border, and Pope Francis' visit to the U.S. Again, welcome. I hope you enjoy this session, and don't forget to continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag CHCIHHM20. But first, a word from our sponsor. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Thomas, and I'm the Vice President of Government Relations at American Honda. Thank you all for joining us for today's discussion. We're going to be hearing from some wonderful speakers, including the Honorable Congresswoman Torres. It's often said that challenges are what make life interesting, but overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. As I look around the world today, I can't imagine that truer words have ever been spoken. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented challenges for people across the world, but the response by so many has reminded us of the importance of helping one another. And what could be more meaningful than that? At Honda, we are proud to have responded quickly to help our communities, but our efforts required close collaboration with our partners in business and in government. One of the partnerships I'm most proud of is the work that we've been doing with the city of Detroit. I'm sure many of you are familiar with our Honda Odyssey minivan, which is proudly made in Alabama. While using our manufacturing know-how, we were able to modify several Odysseys to safely transport potential COVID-19 patients to testing sites across the city. We also moved quickly to team up with Dynaflow, a small company that makes compressors for life-saving ventilators. And through a connection made by the organization Stop the Spread, we were able to help Dynaflow ramp up their production from 300 ventilator compressors a month to 10,000 a month. We also produced 130,000 face shields in Ohio and donated them to medical facilities across the country, including those serving hard hit Latino communities in Los Angeles and Dallas. The ability to come together to support communities in the ways that we'll hear about today makes me proud to be among the business community members who responded to the overwhelming needs created by this pandemic. I look forward to hearing from our speakers today and continuing the good work to help communities across America. Thank you and stay safe. And thank you very much for taking part of your afternoon to join us in what I hope is a very important and an eye-opening conversation. We have a great panel for you today who I want to thank also for their time. And they are the Honorable Javier Becerra, Attorney General of the State of California, Congresswoman Norma Torres from the 35th District of California, Trudy Thorpe, the Senior Director and Program Administrator, of Internet Essentials over at Comcast, and Ana Elena Marciano, the Chief Purchasing Officer of Procter & Gamble. And I do want to apologize in advance for any technical glitches we may have along the way, 
but we want this to be a participatory event. So we ask our audience who has joined us today to please submit your questions so we can have you and uh, and ask our, our panelists those important questions that you may have today. But first of all, I want to get the conversation started by giving an opportunity to our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their background and their role and how it involves crossing that bridge and bringing together that private-public partnership. If we may start with you, Attorney General. Janet, thank you very much. And it's great to be with all of our panelists, including my former colleague, uh, Congress Member Torres, who I served with and had the pleasure to work closely with. I will simply say this. Uh, these are not normal times. Uh, right now, as Fornia is facing just wildfire in its history. and out along with the Western states uh, uh, that COVID-19 in America is hitting us harder than we expected and all things raise challenges for those of us who are public servants in government. But without the partnership, whether it's the partnership with uh, those in the broadband services who help make sure that our kids who are trying to learn from home uh, uh, their schoolwork uh, have access to internet services and enough of it whether it's the work that we're doing with our communities to make sure that businesses can remain open, it all requires a partnership. And so I've been very fortunate to now serve uh, as the Attorney General, before that as a member of Congress. And what I will tell you is this, uh, if you wanna know where a leader is gonna take you, just look at where they've come from. And for me, that means that the most important thing to me is to treat every Californian as essential. And certainly we know that the essential workers throughout our country including those who pick our fruit, who uh, process the meat that we eat. All those folks who are considered essential workers sometimes are treated as dispensable workers. And it's up to us to show them that we care and we know that they are essential in every uh, sense of the word. And so working together with uh, the private sector, we can come together as government, private sector, and community leaders to make a world of difference for people in what are not normal times. So I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Thank you, Congresswoman, are you there? We may be having our first technical glitch, so once we have her back, we'll go to her, uh, Trinity. Thank you so much, Janet and Javier, thank you as well. And to the other panelists, it's such an honor to be on this panel with you guys, learning alongside each of you. Um, so as Janet mentioned, I am responsible for the program administration of the Internet Essentials Program at Comcast. In other words, my team is responsible for how we as a program show up in the communities that we serve. And for those of you who are not familiar or who are less familiar with the Internet Essentials Program, it is a nearly decade old uh, program that offers uh, Internet service access to a low-cost computer, and free digital skills training to help low-income families bridge the digital divide. It is the nation's largest broadband adoption program in the private sector and has connected millions of people to the power of the internet at home. Um, so while Comcast took many steps um, to keep people connected during the pandemic, just as Javier mentioned, working uh, alongside internet service providers to ensure connectivity for students and families, um, our first steps were taken with the Internet Essentials Program alongside our partners uh, in the field to increase the speed of the service, to offer two months free um, service to low-income families through the Internet Essentials Program, and then shortly thereafter to waive a requirement that households entering the program should not have bad debt under a year old owed to us. And then we also offered our, um, opened up our public Wi-Fi hotspots to anyone who needed to use them. Uh, we partnered with organizations far and wide to make content available, um, including partnering with Common Sense Media to offer free resources uh, for remote learning and homeschooling. And just last month, we announced our biggest um, uh, public-private partnership with the Internet Essentials Partnership Program, enabling schools, districts, and other organizations to pay for or sponsor service on behalf of their families. Um, so by the time of our announcement, we had already created agreements with um, our public-private partnerships with uh, a number of organizations to support more than 200 families coming online. Thank you, Trinity. If we may go to Ana Elena while we get the Congresswoman. 
Thank you, Janet. And thank you guys for having me. This is really a great opportunity. It's great to be here. Um, as Janet said, my name is Ana Elena Marciano. I'm the Chief Purchasing Officer at Procter & Gamble. Um, PNG is a consumer good company that strives to be a force for good and a force for growth. We are committed to protecting PNG people, serving our consumer, consumers, and serving our communities. And whether it's supporting hygiene, education, providing a simple necessity like water, um, or delivering essentials for families displaced by disaster, we aim to improve the health and well-being of the communities where we operate. Um, we believe as a company, this is our responsibility, um, and we want to give back to those in need and to those that we work and live with in the communities where we operate. So again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Annalena. We do have the Congresswoman back. Congresswoman, I'm not sure if you heard my initial question, but if you could introduce yourself and please give us a brief background uh, and where you are, how are you working with the private <laughs> sector to bring those, uh, what, what your community needs uh, to the 35th District of California? Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Janet. I'm uh, Congresswoman Norma Torres, uh, the proud representative of the 35th Congress. And we do apologize once again, but we want to keep this conversation going. So I do want to start with COVID with California, as we do have two great representatives of the state here who can talk about that necessity of bringing together the private sector when Washington is in complete gridlock and not getting the help that they need to those communities. Attorney General, we have seen many governors many mayors, attorney generals from different states asking the federal government for help through Twitter, through many, you know, many ways of possible trying to get the attention of Washington. We've seen that the Congress has some help. And uh, but unfortunately, now with the wildfires still COVID ranging from coast to coast uh, in California, how important is to get that help quickly to the communities that need it? And how important is to bring that private sector in when government and Washington is failing? Janet, it's uh, indispensable because the government is not big enough to do it by itself, and it's certainly not nimble enough to get the work done. And so the partnership is indispensable, uh, especially when you think about our small businesses. We need to work closely with them because they're going to have the toughest timing. Our restaurants, our small retailers, how do they survive? You have to coordinate with them so they can continue to do the work that's essential uh, for the community at the same time that they're helping us stay safe. And so whether it was helping uh, produce and acquire the PPE, the personal protective equipment that we needed, the masks and so forth, or whether it was knowing when Costco would be open so you could shop and get the supplies you needed, all those things were essential. And I want to give a shout out to Congresswoman Torres and her colleagues who passed the CARES Act, which sent resources down to the states to help sector uh, merchants to make sure that they could survive through this pandemic. And how do you make sure that help is getting where it needs to go? And how do you ensure accountability throughout the state as the top law enforcement officer? So that's a, a great question because the, the, the chains of supply get disrupted. And so you have to work very closely with those sectors to make sure that you can continue going. And for, for me, one of the most important things we've done is to ensure accountability. Uh, we're making sure, for example, that in California, people aren't price gouged. Consumers don't have to pay exorbitant prices for products simply because they're in short supply or because merchants are trying to take advantage, exploit. And so we're going after those who price gouge in California. We're also trying to make sure that we don't let people get defrauded. Right now, there are a whole lot of people who are in crisis and need certain things. And so they are more susceptible to people who are... Uh, 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 pandering to them and trying to uh, peddle products that are really aren't what they need. And so we're out there trying to make sure that we provide accountability. And so we're trying to make sure, for example, one of the things we're doing right now that's critical is we're looking at the meatpacking industry to make sure that they're providing their workers who are considered essential workers the type of protection that they need. The same goes for growers in our agricultural fields. We have to make sure that as these workers who are considered essential workers, they are protected so that they can go home safely and be with their families. 
And I will ask this question of all the panelists a little later, but we do uh, want to thank you for your time. You have to leave in about a couple of minutes. So I want to ask you a last question and have you leave us with some thoughts as what can we do better as a public sector, as a private sector, as you as attorney general for the next crisis not to catch us off guard and have those public private partnerships ready and in place to serve the community? First, we have to prepare more. Uh, it's clear that the, the American uh, government did not. Uh, there is no reason why the United States, the richest country, the greatest democracy in the world, has the worst outcomes when it comes to COVID-19. So preparing. Secondly, being honest. Uh, our leaders in Washington, D.C. should not have hidden the truth to Americans for so long and downplayed the risks that were involved with COVID-19. We need to be honest with people so they can trust us and have the confidence that we're looking out for their best interest. That was not done. So preparing, being honest, American people will do the rest. It's just give them the real picture of what's going on. Thank you, Attorney General. We really thank you for your time and for your participation, and we hope to see you soon in another seminar. Thank you, Jen. And I would like to continue the conversation, if I may. I'm not sure if the Congresswoman is back with us. Can you hear us? Okay, so if not, I would like to continue talking about COVID and address this to Ana Elena, uh, because at PNG, uh, you, because of your global status, you were able to get a glimpse of what was happening across the world with COVID before many of us had it on our radar. So how was that experience? How did you begin preparing for what was to come here in the US? Um, and you knew that the public sector would need the help of the of your private industry and what you had to offer. Yeah, so you're right, Janet. We saw this coming when the pandemic hit China first, and we have a very strong operation there. Um, and we quickly started um, thinking and reassessing what do we need to do to get prepared ourselves and to protect um, our operations and our people. And as I said before, we stayed um, very determined and on track with our strategy of protecting our employees, giving our consumers what they needed and the products that were essential and helping communities. So soon after the pandemic started in China, we realized we needed to start um, helping with uh, personal protective equipment. And we immediately installed several lines to make masks um, and hand sanitizers around the world. And we honestly started um, thinking that we were going to use all of them for uh, internal consumption for our employees mm -hmm. and be able to operate in our sites. Um, soon to realize again that we had a role to play with the communities where we were operating. So, um, so far, I can give you some numbers. We have donated um, globally more than 2.7 million masks and more than 120 face shields and more than 180,000 liters of hand sanitizers. Um, so we activated our ecosystem, our suppliers help us tremendously, our consumers and our all, all of the connections we had. Um, we partner with um, local and private entities, again, mainly in the US, but around the world. And we also partner with NGOs to help them distributing all of these products. So it required a lot of agility. It required us to learning very quickly um, and then activating our ecosystem to put those um, in production and be able to deliver those to those in need. Fantastic. And Trinity, uh, the pandemic in the beginning and even here now, as we are an example of it, crashed the internet. And many kids around the country are still having big issues to get online, to be able to go to school every day. How are you guys at Comcast addressing from what you can do to be able to help in this time of need? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Janet. I think that one of the biggest things that we've been able to do is use our position at, um, within the community to really help the community itself. So we've built, you know, Javier mentioned this and in, in what he had said, that it's uh, a lot has to deal with trust. Um, that we need trust in in our communities. And I feel like we've built a lot of trust with our network of partners that have allowed us to really quickly mobilize and respond to their needs. So even though uh, eligibility with Internet Essentials was only open originally to households with school-aged children eligible for free price lunch, um, we have 
expanded eligibility 12 times over the past nine years to where we are today where all low income households are eligible within our service area. And less than um, a year later, after doing that, we've um, entered into a COVID environment, into a pandemic, and we were able to take swift action because of the relationships that we've had with uh, nonprofits and with um, our public private partners in the space who could tell us what they needed. Um, and then we can make real change immediately. So we had the internal structure already built, which helped us. And when schools were required to shut down so suddenly, we were able to quickly respond and make decisions like offering 60 days of free internet service or increasing the speed of the service and temporary, temporarily waiving bad debt um, because we had been already making changes along the way uh, with our community partners. So by the nature of the work we do, um, we're embedded in our communities. We have history and relationships with them. And we simply wouldn't have been able to get the word out about any of the work that we do and respond to the needs of the communities in the ways that we have, um, had it not been for the trust that we've built with our partners and, and having them have trust with their constituents um, on the ground, uh, people who are the families that are the benefiting from this program. And I'm a little curious about how your company, so obviously this has been a work in progress for many years. How do you go about finding those disadvantaged communities, maybe Latino communities who are uh, now because of the pandemic at a higher disadvantage, but in other crises because of other situations, uh, we know minorities are usually at a bigger disadvantage regardless of the crisis. So how does your companies throughout the years have gone about finding those communities and putting the help where it really matters and makes a difference. And Elena? Yeah, um, and Janet, you said it, but let me give you some statistics. We know the crisis has disproportionately affected U.S. Hispanics, um, as more than 80% of working adults are providing essential services that help to keep our country running. Um, so these represent an incredible challenge to protect themselves and their families as they are performing these jobs. And then on the other hand, job and wage losses due to COVID have hit Hispanics the hardest with um, about 61% affected. Um, so obviously this required an immediate action, right? So PNG for uh, mm -hmm. joint efforts with the all, um, we are all human foundations to kick off the Hispanic start. Um, which is an initiative aimed at bringing together individuals and corporations um, to, benefit, uh, to benefit Hispanics affected by COVID by donating, volunteering, or sharing information for faster recovery. Um, I know that many other companies like Pepsi, IBM, Cargill, and a few others have also pledged to donate funds, foods, or products to support those affected. Um, so we had more than 10 Hispanic stars um, cities around America that have mobilized and their local communities to donate, volunteer, and raise awareness of the disproportional negative impact that the pandemic has had in the U.S. Um, we partnered also with Matthew 25 and the Hispanic Star um, local hubs, um, and we were able to distribute more than 1 million products in six major uh, cities, reaching nearly 25,000 Hispanics and families in need. Um, and during the Hispanic Heritage Month, we will be providing additional aid to Hispanic communities around the country, including all of their hub, hubs that uh, we have around the world. So in essence, it's about partnering um, with NGOs, partnering with local and private uh, organizations that help distributing and donating all of these products and help us reaching out to these communities, hospitals and, play, and communities that are in need. And as I was asking the attorney general, do you then follow through to make sure there is accountability and that that help that you're providing from your private sector, it's getting to the ground and through those NGOs are being filtered to the people that actually need it? Um, the answer is absolutely yes, right? You need that accountability ha happens to have or it starts with who we are as a company. And um, in the case of Procter & Gamble, citizenship priorities, it is embedded in our DNA and who we are as a company. Um, so in addition of having the team and people dedicated to establishing very strong relationship with governments and leaders, 
we have a team that is dedicated to disaster relief. Um, they, we have more than 200 charity organizations around the world um, that are helping and being able to help providing relief due to the pandemic, um, which includes Feeding America and Matthew 25. So the accountability comes with making those connections, establishing them from, um, from the very beginning, being that part of our strategy. You don't create those relationships at the very last minute. We have to have a very strong foundation foundation of um, creating this partnership and this trust with both government and with the private sector. Um, and as I said, for all of this to happen, credible and trustworthy relationship must be the foundation. And this only happens over time through lots of outreach, education, and participation in events to demonstrate to policymakers and influencers that companies like P&G is capable of, capable of doing so we can play a role on being a force for change and a force for good. Thank you, and Elena, Trinity, let me go back to the first question about how do you make sure that you're reaching those communities that are most at need? Yeah, thank you so much for that. So I would, you know, so much, Ana Elena, of what you said just resonates with, you know, our driving ethos at Comcast too. It's when our communities thrive that we can thrive. And I think that nobody can deny that black and brown families have been the hardest hit by not only the coronavirus itself, but by the economic, financial, educational, housing, um, and countless other problems that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and just like you said, it's this strong foundation that really has made it possible for us to make sure that what we do reaches the end user, the community, the customer, the family themselves. And so we have, and we, we've, you know, we've always done this. It's the, that's the foundation. So we've always made our materials for our program available in multiple different languages. In fact, our um, COVID-19 promo, the two month free offer collateral is available in 29 languages. And mm -hmm. we have always had um, our uh, Spanish language and English language on all of our, our collateral since the beginning of the program and have added in dozens of other um, different languages in, in the process as well, um, based on the needs of our community partners themselves. We've attended events, thousands, tens of thousands of events over the past nine years that are community driven and community led. And we've supported those events. We've supported the initiatives by members, by elected officials, by um, housing authorities and by others to make sure that they're populations are specifically reached. And so I have a high level of confidence that um, our populations, our communities are really the ones that are benefiting from this program. And I, I think nothing tells that story better than the, the stories themselves of the customers whose lives we have impacted, um, which I have countless ones that I, I love to share with people, but I'll, I'll spare everyone the time here. <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you, Trinity. And I believe our Congresswoman is back. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Your audio. Yes, fantastic. So I'm sure you heard a bit of it of that. We've been talking from the private sector side about Latino disadvantage, getting the help. So I want to hear from your perspective. It's been very difficult times here in Washington. And as I was talking to the attorney general, very difficult times in California as well. So when you see the need in your community and you see the gridlock in DC, how do you go about bringing that help to your community with the help of the private sector? I would say um, that the private sector has been an incredible partner uh, for me in the community. Um, you know, a bigger example, I would say it's it's the uh, manufacturing of, of a vaccine. Um, it's the private sector that stepped up um, when even the federal government was still trying to figure out, um, you know, how we we're going to fund it, when, um, how quickly can we get it done? Um, they stepped up. And for, for me personally, you know, we went through a list of, of local manufacturers in our district um, when we found out that uh, hand sanitizer was not available, masks were not available, and that our frontline workers were in critical need of these supplies. Um, many of those uh, very small businesses stepped up um, and rearranged their manufacturing 
um, plants uh, to be able to produce what we needed. You know, and they, and they work so quickly um, that I'm very impressed. And I don't think that um, we could have survived without the private sector um, skin in the game as they saw it. They saw it as it is It is our call to duty um, to help alleviate the problem that we're seeing in our communities. And these are, these are our customers. These are the people that we depend on. And when the help was passed in Washington, I'm talking about the CARES Act, essential workers, I'm referring to especially undocumented Latino immigrants in this country were left out. Many families with mixed statuses were left out to get any of that help. Does the private sector then plays a very critical role to be able to get the help that the federal government by politics um, is not willing to give to those uh, to those people in, that are still in very much a lot of need? Congresswoman? The fact that um, we left out so many tax paying um, U.S. residents out of the assistance that they you know, desperately needed is, uh, is a black eye to um, U.S. lawmakers, uh, in, in my opinion. The private sector stepped up, ensuring that the food banks you know, had uh, the supplies that they needed uh, you know, from the ag community to, I have a, a, an egg farm uh, in, in, in one of my cities and they stepped up and donated you know, a lot of eggs to ensure that people have the basics that they needed. Local clinics, um, you know, local doctors stepped up and some of them volunteered to take on uh, the additional um, burden of having to take on so many people that needed their care who were frankly afraid um, to reach out and, and, and get the help that they needed. And let me ask you one question as we bring in our audience now. Congresswoman, how are we seeing government acquisition systems adapt to phase a median needs around PPE technology and basic needs represented by COVID-19? So we've been slow um, at ensuring that, from the federal government perspective, you know, we, we, we should have had um, a better plan to help unify our states and, and, and to use our purchasing power um, in order to benefit um, the money that was being spent by, by our states on critical supplies that they needed. Um, but, I, but then I, I saw state governments um, working together, again, unifying themselves and filling the void of leadership where um, this administration fell and failed to provide that leadership. And Trinity and Elena, I'm curious if you on your end, mm -hmm. many of these mm -hmm. public officials were tweeting, were asking for help as I was addressing earlier with uh, the Attorney General. Were you guys, when you were logging in on Twitter, on social media, seeing this and see and making a call, picking up the phone and saying, such as such is asking for such help and we better get to them as soon as possible? Was that a situation during COVID? Trinity, I see you're shaking your head. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm shaking my head, but probably not for the exact same reason maybe that Anna Lena is. Um, I'm shaking my head because I think we we oftentimes didn't, didn't have um, the opportunity, I guess, to see the Twitter uh, requests come through. And in fact, I think that's because oftentimes we had the relationship with the organizations already where we were either reaching out to them in advance or they were reaching out to us directly as opposed to via social media. So um, early on in the pandemic, multiple school districts reached out to us to help drive a solution to getting their kids online and to fix what is the number one barrier to online education and internet connection at home. Um, and while we partnered with districts to create all those solutions for connectivity, uh, we were also having conversations with teachers and principals and community-based organizations proactively to more fully understand all of the challenges to distance learning um, and to see where else we might be able to be helpful. And Anela, were you able to see yeah, any of those tweets and react to them? Tone, yes, exactly. Because we are we are a marketer, right? We are a company that um, our expertise is in marketing. Um, so you know, obviously, the impact that platforms such as digital media can have in helping disseminate important information was one of those things that we immediately acted on. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, 
In Ohio, we partner with Govern on the Wine in two separate campaigns. One, we work with TikTok, uh, Phenom Charlie D'Amelio, and our partners to drive attention to the call that he was making to help slow the spread of the coronavirus and have some fun as well, right? Um, so the distance dance was meant to inspire young people to practice social distancing. And for the first 3 million videos posted, Procter & Gamble would make a donation to Feeding America and Matthew 25 ministers to help families in need. Um, the second one we, we helped with was the Mask on Ohio campaign, encouraging people to wear a mask um, to protect others. So um, we, we've been raising, uh, raising and, and helping creating awareness and p and also produced and helped launch the film Estados Unidos, which was created as a Circulo Creativo um, initiative. And the film illustrates the vital role that U.S. Hispanics are playing during COVID-19 and invites everyone to join the Hispanic Star Movement. So we have a role to play and we were able to support those through media marketing. So let me take you a step back because without the pandemic, maybe some of these initiatives would have not taken place or would have taken a different, um, would have been a little different. So how do you um, say, oh, this is an opportunity, let's get on this. And how quickly is that turnaround? Well, I, uh, Janet, I tell you the TikTok uh, campaign was created in a matter of days. And it happened mm -hmm. to have that governor, governor um, the wine was in a meeting where David Taylor, our CEO was, and they were talking about the need to spread the word and talk about and incentivate people to follow social distancing. So immediately we came up with this idea. Um, so so it was, it was, I tell you, it was put on air in a matter of days. So the agility and the ability of doing and acting was huge, would have, you know, thought about it before, obviously not. We didn't have a pandemic before and the world was writing history and writing the book as we were learning. But for me, the biggest um, the biggest inspiration here is how fast we were able to act and how fast we were able to put on the media and, and all the on social media. In many ways, you were almost ready without knowing it. And now you know I that know. you were ready. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. And we had a great uh, system internally and externally that immediately help us doing this. I mean, it was with the collaboration of our agencies and, and our internal people, external. So we, we created this ecosystem that you're right, it was there. We activated the ecosystem extremely fast, but it was there and we were able to, um, to leverage. Great, let me bring the Congresswoman in for another question. With the unprecedented levels of public-private partnership in response to COVID-19, Will this create a better system for public-private partnerships in the future? What do you think, Congresswoman? Do you think you're better set now in your community with the help of the private sector? Absolutely. Um, for starters, I think um, we found uh, great partners um, that could that were more than willing to help uh, during the time of need. Uh, and I don't think from, you know, our community's perspective, our local governments, um, hospitals and clinics that we're desperately looking for uh, protective equipment for their employees are going to forget um, how quickly the private sector responded to their call. So those are partnerships and friendships um, that have been set up during a most um, difficult time in, you know, in, in, um, in our state, in our community. And I think those are long lasting relationships. And before that, how did you cultivate those, those relationships? So they were there ready in time of need and they're even able to help you when there is not a crisis. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had really good, um, partnerships, um, with, with, you know, both as a, as a local um, elected official and now in, um, you know, in state and federal uh, government, I've always, um, you know, catered to that relationship and in, ensure that we were able to work together. But I think, um, you know, from the perspective of an urgency and the emergency that we saw where lives were being lost, um, that is, um, it, 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 it's, it, it's a whole different game 
um, that will be with us for a long time. Let me give you an example. Our um, some hospitals in our community um, were lacking, you know, basic gowns and masks and you know that kind of stuff. And and our office was able to connect with other hospitals and other clinics and and help them connect each other and um, share the equipment until we were able to get either our county, our um, state um, uh, government and federal uh, government to work together to deliver the equipment that they needed. Um, so that's how we work together uh, in, in my community. And I, I'd say they were very successful and those partnerships are there for the long haul. And now you briefly said that, that you don't believe your constituents will soon forget the help of the private sector. Tell me a little more what has been the response of those Californians that you do serve as to getting that help. Um, I, I think their response is, you know, they, they want to see an economy that is, um, is going to be um, helpful to the people that were there during a time of great need. Um, when they see federal programs um, that are available for small, small business, whether it's a loan or to help them keep their employees um, you know, on employed, they want to see more of that because they see a direct benefit by them being able to keep their employees. They see that their employees are paying rent. So that helps another small business. They're able to put food on the table. So that keeps, you know, grocery stores uh, going. And, and it's a whole other uh, group of people. And that's the Latino community. Those are the jobs that we hold. You know, we are uh, the nurses. We are in grocery stores. Uh, for my district, being in the front lines of the logistics industry um, for the Western states, they certainly have stepped up to the plate with both um, public and part and in private partnerships. So those those relationships, I think, are there for the for for the long term. And we do hope that this pandemic will be over in the near future. But these partnerships must continue. So how do we ensure that the partnerships do continue throughout the years? And how do you continue working in non crisis times, Trinity? How do we continue working in non-crisis times? I think we continue leveraging these public-private partnerships in a way that um, is exactly like Representative Torres just said, where we're we're working together, kind of setting aside um, some of some of the the sticking points that might have existed in the past, setting those aside for the willingness to create solutions and to save lives. Um, and I think that exists, uh, you know, in, in pandemic times or in all times. And what puts us in a great position to do that is having those existing relationships, having that strong foundation that Anna Elena talked about, working with local governments, not only during those disaster times, but now, or, you know, always. Um, and at, being at Comcast, I can see that Comcast is really deeply embedded in the communities that we serve and works with our local governments as part of disaster preparation plans and um, is, is really supporting people who are on the ground um, and on ground efforts in the field. And I think, you know, we have to come together. It just takes willingness and flexibility on the approach. And that's something that I think I've learned and that I think everyone at, at Comcast has learned and probably came into thinking that, but uh, didn't put it in practice. And I think we'll carry with us through the long run here. Um, and I think our Internet Essentials Partnership Program is just a really great example of this. There is really no one uniform agreement um, between us and our 70 partners. Um, each has required discussion and the setting of expectations and really outside the box thinking. Um, and we know we haven't got it all figured out. And I think everybody right now realizes that. And so I hope that that mentality carries us forward to rely on each other, to bring multiple people to the table, um, to help identify new solutions. And then Elena, the same question to you. How does this look at these partnerships in non-crisis times? Yeah, well, um, Janet, the first thing I will say is that it has to be built as part of the 
DNA and the strategy of a company. And I can say that uh, I can say that with very with, and I'm very proud of that. That that's the case of PNG, as I said before. It's part of DNA. It's part of our citizenship strategy. With that said, um, strengths come from uh, with unity, right? And we believe that fostering these relationships across sectors and working together seamlessly will help us continue and to overcome any pos potential disasters that come our way in the future. And we must do it together, right? And finding these synergies mm -hmm. and establishing partnerships to be a force for good and a force for growth. Um, do in you, our case, do you, Hispanic... uh -huh. let Go me ahead. ask you, let me, let me pause you right there. I'm, I'm curious, do you seek, when you say fostering partnerships, is it not only public, private, but also private, private seeking each other's help, Comcast, yeah. PNG coming together to uh, enhance each other's help into the community? Absolutely, and Elena? absolutely. And, and we have uh, many partnership with competes and non-competes. This is not about competing for anything. This is about helping communities and helping uh, and giving back. So the answer is a big yes. We need uh, private, public. We need private, private with, um, as I said before, with NGO and, uh, and groups and associations that help us reach out to the ones that are in need. And we also need private, private to make those, um, those uh, systems to be stronger than be able to act when we have a crisis like that. Yeah. Trinity, you want to jump in? Yeah, sorry. I just want to, I just want to jump right in there. I absolutely agree with that. And I'm reading a philosophy book to my kids at night. It's a, a book for kids. Don't worry. I'm not reading them. You college level <laughs> philosophy. Um, and I have three young children and one of the chapters that we read was on knowledge and the chapter mentioned, you know, adults don't know everything. And my kids were like, what? They don't know everything. I thought they did. <laughs> I'm like, no, um, we actually, we don't know everything. And if we did, we could have solved things like the pandemic, racism, poverty. We could have solved these things already. What is needed is our coming together, our collective knowledge, whether that be private to private, private to public, nonprofit to private, you name it. We need us all coming together because there's no silver bullet. Um, we have to think collectively and think differently and use our resources um, that we offer individually in a collective manner so that we can provide um, uh, responses that are best suited to the needs of each individual community. So I'll pose this question to you. Janet, I, I have yes, to ask yes. you, it requires commitment, right? It requires that we are really no. um, convinced that this is the right thing to do as a private sector. And, and in our case, making the Hispanic community and continue to help them to be at the forefront of the relief and the recovery efforts. And um, if you have that commitment, then those connections will happen, the relationships will be built, and you create a program as a private sector that is uh, systemic and is, is really embedded into the way we do business. Of course. And let me ask this question of the three of you, starting with the Congresswoman. So what other topics or big policy challenges could be met with these uh, types of public-private models? What, what do you think is the next big challenge that you all could solve from the public sector, Congresswoman? I think the public um, awareness that needs to happen around the need to um, manufacture um, here in the U.S. And um, what does that mean um, to a consumer that, you know, is used to or only wants to pay the cheapest, um, you know, the lowest price for every item? I think um, there needs to be outreach and education as to the benefits of having certain things, um, certainly related to health care, um, be made right here um, in the U.S. by American workers, um, by our own neighbors. The dependability, um, what we saw, whether it, it was pharmaceuticals, um, whether it was, you know, PPE equipment, um, it just wasn't there in the very beginning stages because none of that is manufactured here in the U.S. Um, so I think one of our biggest challenges that we face moving forward um, is ensuring that we continue to have a partnership, yes, but at the same time, educate our consumers 
that it is worth paying that extra 50 cents for something that is made here in the US. Trinity. So I think I think we can solve so much um, by coming together and by using lessons that we've learned during the pandemic. I, I have the conversations with my husband almost every day how I hope that we don't walk out of this and have learned nothing. Um, and I hope that we can solve, like I think education, for example, could and educational equity can be one of the areas where we walk out of this pandemic stronger and having narrowed that gap um, in a way that in other times wouldn't have happened. Um, I think, you know, for, for some issues, I think we've learned the size of the problem or simply that we didn't know what the size was, but that it's a lot bigger than what we thought it was. So if we can come together to understand even this, how big the issues are, that would be helpful. And the world is just changing so quickly and problems are evolving so rapidly and solutions that we that used to be debated over months and years, as we all know and have talked about, have, have to be crafted just as quickly, sometimes overnight. Um, and personally, the nature of my work has changed. I know the nature of all of our work has, has changed significantly. I mean, look at us all here right now, talking, presenting, and, and, and doing it all online from, from our homes. Um, and I, I, I just think that we, it's basically like a lived symphony experience, us all coming together in a way that we, we just never imagined. And if we can continue to do this, I think there's so much that we can, we can impact. And I hope that we begin or at least make an effort in the educational equity space. Annalena? Yeah, I would say um, that the first and foremost is that we need to continue staying together and working and be committed to work with our communities and helping them, right? Um, that's again, commitment number one. Um, but the other thing that we learned tremendously is um, the role that equity uh, and inclusion has in our strategies. And, and how we approach um, that in the future. Um, and equity is or equality, it's about giving people access and opportunity um, of in, to investments and jobs. And that comes with the ability that we have or not to provide education to the Hispanic community, for instance. So they at, at the same time have the opportunity to have access and they can go for these opportunities. But you need to have, um, sometimes private sectors and communities having a commitment to give these opportunities to these people and um, give them access to those jobs so they can go and, um, and apply for those, right? And then make an investment on them. An investment is the education piece, is a piece of helping those communities um, empower them economically means education. They cannot, they, they increase their economic empowerment when they are more educated. And when they are able to do more business and offer some things, then economic empowerment of the entire community uh, grows. So um, it's the, to summarize, it's really coming together as a community. We, we learn that we can't do this by ourselves. Nobody can do it. We need to stay together in all kinds of forms and shapes. Um, and the second piece is equality and inclusion and making that to be part of our strategy and really genuinely believe on, on increasing access and opportunities to the communities. And we only have five minutes and I do have one last question. So I want to bring it into your final thoughts as we go around. Um, and they're asking whether you, this bridge organizations can also not only bring on opportunities, but bring social change to our communities. And as you have approached COVID from your sectors the, the private and public what have you learned and in the future can that social change be made and congresswoman i would like to give you the final word um i would we'll start say with you and then we'll go down mm -hmm. it's been it's been wonderful um listening to all of you here today and i think everyone on this call has displayed the same passion about you know, collaboration. Um, and if we continue to ignite that fire of the need to, to work together closely, um, none of us can afford to do this on our own. 
Um, it's going to happen because we're working together. We're going to survive this virus. We're going to survive this time of uh, incredible pain in our communities, um, in our states, and in our nation. Um, and how the world is viewing the U.S. We're going to do that by working together. So the commitment is there. The commitment will continue to be there as long as you know average people. Um, working together with their, their local, state, and federal um, bodies uh, can continue to answer those calls. And that is, you know, the call in our community um, that they want us to work together. They want to see, they want to see us unifying um, ourselves for the betterment of not just the economy, um, but, you know, our climate, our environment. Thank you, Trinity. Yeah, so I, I'm super excited about this question. Um, in March, just before everything closed, um, we held a summit in Philadelphia where we brought together um, partners from the healthcare, education, and workforce development um, communities all over the country. And it was a great opportunity for us to learn from each other um, how helping to close the digital divide, um, if we put some more effort into, um, into this work, could actually help with education and workforce and healthcare and the, the impacts that, that um, people are seeing in their lives and in the community. And one of the questions that we asked to our attendees was, um, it's 2025 and the digital divide has been closed. Um, what, what does life look like now? And to hear the different people come together and say, you know, we, we have um, communities where everyone is making over $100,000 a year. Or we have businesses, black and brown businesses that are um, rising up by the thousands and thousands in, uh, you know, across the country. And we have um, educational equity. Um, it, it was just, it was a, a point of inspiration. And I think that those things, if we can think that way, then we will produce change that leads that way. As a Latina, I'm it would super be a proud. Great, um, it will be a sorry. great world. I do have to stop you because I only have a minute 30 and I want to give Van a Go little ahead. time, fair time sorry. as well. But it would, it, it does sound like an ideal, ideal world. And I'm going to be super fast and simple. I, I would say that together, and this is private, public, we must continue finding synergies and establishing these partnerships to be a force for good, whether we do it with education, equality and inclusion, but real and, and, and systemic interventions that help us drive in our Hispanic force and giving them access and opportunity to, um, to the investments that, they, that exist outside. So it's about staying together. And for sure, we cannot do this alone, but we can do it together. Together, I think that's the the word that, that has come again and over again uh, throughout this hour. I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank um, also Attorney General Becerra for joining us earlier today. Thanks to our audience who was so participant that was able to get questions to us. I'm so sorry we didn't get through all of them. Thank you very much for taking the time to join this conversation. I hope that we can get inspired to come together to seek these organizations, to seek the NGOs and come help them any way we can. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.